You've entered Bookstorm with Kristen Civiletto and me, Chris Storm. This is a podcast devoted to best-selling books that matter, books that make a difference. We're diving down deep with beloved authors about their stories. We're exposing hot-button topics and heartfelt themes, the issues that affect each of us in our own lives as siblings, parents, partners, friends, as human beings. We're braving new ideas, fresh thoughts, hard lessons and important truths. Those kinds of things that stay with us long after we turn the last page and close the book. Welcome back to Bookstorm Podcast. Listeners literally all over the world, we're super grateful for you. Guess who we have with us here today? You're going to be super excited. We have Darby Kane with a new book that's coming out called The Engagement Party. Darby, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. We're thrilled to have you. Now, I want to tell our listeners a little bit about you. You know we're in love already, I'm sure. Did you know that she was a former trial attorney? She is the number one, a number one internationally best selling author of domestic suspense. You'll recognize the name of her first two thrillers, which Kristen and I loved Pretty Little Wife and Replacement Wife, which I read have both, they've been optioned for what? What Darby? television? Television. television? Yeah. By who? Um, the Pretty Little Wife is actually at Amazon. Uh, with Gabrielle Union attached to Star, and uh, the replacement wife, Imagine Entertainment, which is Ron Howard's group, they they have that. Wow! Congratulations Thank for you that. So much. That is that would make a great show. Would love I, to see I think it. So, too. <laughs> so she's also been featured in numerous venues with recommendations and endorsements by people like the New York Times, Book Review, the Washington Post, Toronto Star. New York Post, Goodreads, Huffington Post, and I could go on and on. Very highly regarded, very well deserved. Here's something you might not know. Darby Kane wasn't always Darby Kane, the thriller writer. She started her career under her real name, Helen K. Diamond. She was an author of contemporary romance and romantic suspense. How cool is that? She loves writing romance and still does. Am I right? Still on that? Yes, very much. But yeah. after pending dozens, she also wanted to try writing some of those deliciously twisted thrillers that she's read forever. Since books like books like romance uh, thrillers don't guarantee a happy ending like romance novels do, that's how she took on the new name Darby Kane. And we got to ask you, how'd you come up with Darby Kane? Oh man, it's I it, Darby is actually if you've ever read the Pelican Brief or seen the movie The Pelican Brief, the female lead in that her name is Darby. So I really liked the name and I thought it I thought it fit and then it was trying to find a last name that worked with Darby and it it ends up being an entire publisher decision on what works, what's the best. <laughs> <laughs> you lose control. <laughs> I'm glad they picked it. It does sound sort of suspense thrillery, Darby Kane, and I love it. And she was a native of Pennsylvania, now living in California, but we're glad you are here on the air with Bookstorm all over the world, 70 countries, all 50 states, 1,450 cities or some wonderful number. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, Debbie, we're here to talk about the engagement party, and I like to give our listeners just a short summary of what the book is about, which is very hard here because we can't give away any thrillers or, or spoilers. So I'm going to go ahead and make an attempt, and if you want to add anything at the end, be my guest. Now, this thriller is set on a private island in Maine, which is already scary in light of the descriptions and, and how you get to this island. This house harbors people, it harbors secrets, and all kinds of things go down. Years ago, the backdrop is Emily Hunt went missing from her affluent liberal arts school and on graduation weekend. Her body was found floating in a river and a loner uh, who may or may not have been involved with her death was accused and then he ended up taking his life and dying by suicide. 
There was a link there, but it was not a correct link. So 12 years later, we have her college friends who almost all of them knew Emily, not all, gather together to celebrate an engagement at this house on the private island in Maine. There's only one way in and one way out. We have a tremendous storm that is brewing as part of the backdrop. And one of the characters, Sierra Prescott, she's a guest. She didn't know Emily, but she's got a sense that something is not right. There is an unease and a tension that builds and builds throughout your story. And then when a man is found dead in a trunk on the property, now we've ratcheted it up. There's a note that's left telling all of the friends to tell the truth. And now there is a hunt of people that is underway. Would you like to add anything? I, I that was really that hard. Was so good. <laughs> that was so good. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. And again, those spoilers, because there's things you just don't see coming in this story, which is one of the reasons why, why we loved it so much. Well, awesome. Well, Chris, why don't you kick us off and we'll enter the storm? Well, I have to say for all the listeners, I sat on the edge of my chair into the dark hours of the night. I couldn't put it down. I love suspense thriller. And I like this quote from the novel. The problem with obsession is it can backfire. We see this in the real world with relationships, business, politics. When the we and us becomes a me, myself, and I, when you'll do anything to anyone in order to win, this is some scary stuff. I had to ask you as the writer, what drove some of your characters to the brink of obsession? How do we save ourselves from ourselves? Well, and it, yeah, how do we save ourselves from ourselves, right? I, I think different things motivated them to get on the island. For some of them, it was, you know, I want to see people I love and I haven't seen for a long time. That's not most of what happened. Most of it is, is my secret still safe? Um, all of those kind of underlying, I have to be there in case something gets out and I have to control it. All of those things are happening. And when I think whenever you have secrets and you pack people together, this is why I love locked room thrillers, right? Like you take a whole bunch of people with something in common in their past and you trap them together somewhere eventually it's all going to come out, right? Like the secrets are going to tumble out. You cannot hide it. And as the stakes rise in, in this book, and they do rise because there is a body count in this book. There's no question about it. As they rise, people become more and more desperate to, to some to find out the secrets, some to hide the secrets, some to like try to push the blame onto somebody else. I, I just think it's kind of, I, I try to imagine what would you do if the, worst moment of your life was wrapped up in what was a great time of your life, right? Like they, if, if I think one of the characters says at one point, if, if, if everything had stopped the day before graduation, our lives would be totally different. And that is true. Cause it's like the decision that was made on one day and what happened on one day now just taints everything. And it, Kristen and I were saying it shocked us, but this is real life too how they were able to keep that secret. It, it was, it was, that was an obsession keeping that secret. Absolutely. I think it becomes like your full-time job, right? Because, because it, it, that's the problem with outrunning your past. You got to keep running, right? Like you can't stop. And the lies just pile upon the lies, the secrets pile upon the secrets. And then it just gets worse and worse and worse. It was a cool scenario. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Absolutely. Darby, one of your characters, and I like Chris's word earlier, deliciously dark thriller, <laughs> um, was reflecting on guilt. And he says to himself, this is a quote, he tried to buy his soul back in a bunch of ways over the years, volunteering, donating, none of it worked. Redemption was a process. Now, many people can identify with those thoughts. There's no doubt. Where does truth come into play? And, you know, is it the start of redemption and is it necessary to tell the truth to actually be free? I, I think it is. I mean, I think a lot of people can say, oh, I made the mistake and I wouldn't do it again. Okay. But that's, is that enough? Is that, you know, I mean, a, a, a person, two people died, two young people in their twenties died in this book. So saying I'm sorry, or I'm going to try to live a better life that doesn't resolve what happened back then. And I think the only way 
to really be redeemed is to take ownership of it. Like you've got to, you've got to say what the truth is, let it be known, and then take responsibility for it. Right. You know, I, I do think redemption is a process. It's not like you get to say, I'm sorry once and be done. You have to live it. You have to walk it. Um, and nobody in this book is able to do that. <laughs> There's no question. <laughs> yeah. I pictured that character spinning his wheels throughout his life with the volunteering and the donating, yeah. no matter what he did, those actions, they weren't addressing that core lie that he was building his life upon. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, it, a lot of times people will read a book and they're like, I don't like any of the characters as the author. I, of course, love something about all of them, right? Like they, there's a reason they're in this book. And that character specifically, I think is, is actually like a lot of people where they're very sorry for something and they can't figure out kind of how to get out of their own way to take responsibility for it. And once they do, their entire life will be upended, right? Like you have to be willing to take that. And I, I don't know, I don't know that many of us are like, I'm, I'm you know, it's really hard. Oh, agree. It's super tough. And I loved all the characters here, even with their flaws, no matter what, where they came from, what they may have done or have not done. But I got to talk about Emily. She intrigued me. This is a fantastic mystery, all built around the missing Emily, the, the dead Emily. Who was she? Let's dive down deeper. She didn't seem like that very nice of a person. She wasn't a good friend. She manipulated people. She played games. She used men just for a game. Now, of course, she didn't need deserve to be murdered. We're not saying that. But you added such a very cool, realistic scenario because guess what? All of our friends and relatives who've passed away, they're not always good people. As the writer, what was it about Emily, you created her, that intrigued us so? And even though we didn't like her much, we had to know who her killer was. We were desperate to find out, despite her moral judgment. I And I, I really wanted her to not be perfect, right? I wanted her to be three-dimensional because I, I don't know about you, but I would not want to be judged on the choices I made and who I was at 21, right? The, I'm, you know, I was an awkward mess. I, hopefully that's not where I am now. So, but I wanted to kind of pin her down in that age where she hasn't had the opportunity to live a different life, to not be like her parents, to make better choices, to say, this is this isn't doing anything for me. Let me do something else. She doesn't get that chance. So once she gets that chance, she's kind of like locked in amber, right? The, some people will will say, will will do away with all the flaws and pretend they're not there and make you know make her into this perfect paragon. Other people won't, I think, outwardly say she deserved it, but there's a piece of them that thinks. Well, Okay. We're going to be friends anyway, right? Like the horrible things. But I know, you know, I know just from personal experience, I like, you know, like my, my mom will talk about like some relative and she's describing them like, like, like they're saints. And I'm like, that person sounds great. I have no idea who that person is, but that person sounds great. And I, I wanted to play with that a little bit with Emily Hunt. And I think there's just the idea that you know, there's so there's such an interest in true crime, right? Um, you know, I'm the same way. And what we see a lot of times is like pretty young women get a lot of TV time. And we don't always hear about who they really were, or everybody always says they're great, they're great, they're great. Well, what what if somebody's not so great? Like what what does that mean? And do they deserve any less of like everything we have to try to solve it for them? I liked it. It was a really great twist. It did two things. It said, hey, I can relate to her a little bit because none of us are perfect. Right. Secondly, it, it also made the reader think, did all of her mistakes have something to do with her death? And it also made us realize, hey, it doesn't matter if you're a good person or not. You're not allowed to get murdered. This is right. against the law. <laughs> right, right. It's always bad. That's the answer. It always has to be bad. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I want to go back to something you were just talking about with true crime. You know, we've seen an explosion of true crime podcasts and I'm, I'm laughing right now because I'm thinking about only murders in the building oh, that's so and good. it's so good. And, um, you know, people are amateur sleuths. 
right? They're running down clues, locations, and even witnesses in an attempt to settle yeah. the case. Yes. Sometimes successfully. And is there a danger though, that some people will go too far, you know, that they'll go over the edge in that quest to solve a crime? Yeah, I think definitely. And, and I don't want to be hypocritical here. Like I, there is nobody who has watched more Dateline more 48 hours, more Netflix documentaries than than me. There really isn't. So, <laughs> but I I think what happens is you have to be really careful that somebody's pain and trauma doesn't become your entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. Like like it's not a game. Somebody is actually dead. There are people who love this person who are, you know, in despair. And you have to remember that. And I think there's a lot of talk now about how, you know, true crime, it's bad. I don't, I don't think it's bad. I think, I think it's important that it's out there. You know, the more we watch, the more we consume hope, hopefully the smarter we are and how we live our lives and, and what we do. Um, and there's a whole group of people who are looking for answers when it comes to true crime. Like how many times have you seen the show where it's like, I grew up and the billboard had this young woman's face on it. So when I, 20 years later, I decided to look into it and they solve it, right? Like they, they bring it back into the consciousness of everybody. And now DNA has changed. Everything has changed and we can resolve it. That is the fantastic side of it, right? Like Gabby Petito goes missing and somebody on TikTok who knows what her van looks like spies it and says, oh my gosh, the van's here. And now everything starts to, you know, come apart. And that's the good piece, right? Like that's the good piece where people are trying to help, but you know, there's always a line, right? Where you cross and it becomes, it becomes a game. It becomes a challenge. It becomes a who can get there first. And now you're not actually doing anything for the victim or the victim's family or trying to solve the case. You're kind of doing something for you. And, and I think that's where the line switches and it's, it's, it's hard. It really is hard. But, you know, if, if one young woman sees Gary, Gabby Petito's story and doesn't get in the camper van with the bad boyfriend, good. Then, then I'm, then I'm okay with whatever's happening. Yeah. Yeah. What a great point. It, it kind of a bigger picture. It makes you check your motives yes. and there are good motives. And then there are motives that are pushing you in a bad direction. But I, I love what you said. And I've often thought about that too, where I'm like, why am I completely consumed by this story and the news? Part of it, I hope is I want to stop and pause and give recognition to that person's life, the fact that they lived and honor that. And of course, there's that interest of well, what right. happened and who was involved. We're complicated, you know, creatures, and there's always going to be these a uh, mixture of emotions. But I love that you examine that in the story. There are a lot of very deep moral themes going on here. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I did. I wanted to think about like kind of how the true crime crime sleuths help and hinder and in this case they more hindered than helped um and helped create a problem that wasn't there and i think that does happen i think unfortunately that's realistic and we have to remember it yeah yeah excellent and I, like, I like what you said too we're a different world today so we're watching these documentaries we listen to these podcasts we're interested but we're learning something yeah. And maybe we as citizens can keep an eye out for each other a little bit more. It, it's much different with DNA and social media. There are very few secrets that go around. And uh, I like that too. That's intriguing. Yeah. It well, is. Give us a clue. We got to know because we love this so much. I got to hold it up for our YouTube watchers. The Engagement Party by Darby Kane. You're going to love it. You heard a little of the discussion here. This is just the tip of the iceberg because we can't give spoilers what are you working on next as Darby Kane? I um I actually have finished the book that will come out next December. Um, and it is it is one of the uh, all, every thriller I've written has been kind of female centric, right? Because I grew up um reading thrillers and a lot of them were male centric, and I wanted to write female centric. And this is a woman who blackmails a man into marriage to destroy him. And the book is why? What, how does she do it? Why is it happening? And uh, what does it all mean? So it was, it was 
absolutely fun to write. It's my first book that I've written in first person rather than third person, you know, as a craft. So it was, uh, so it was just new and fun for me. Well, that sounds fantastic. You're taking us inside minds, even with this book, inside the minds of some normal people and some twisted psychotic <laughs> people. <laughs> and it's kind of a very interesting place to go. Thank you so much. Well, I want to tell our listeners, you've got to connect with Darby Kane. You maybe also want to connect with Helen K. Diamond and check out these romance novels that are wonderful. You can find Helen K. Diamond dot com website, darbycane.com website, two separate websites, right? Yes. Yeah. You've got a you're big on Twitter, I see. You got both on Twitter, got both on Instagram. You have Darby Kane on Facebook. Yes. I don't visit Facebook as much, but she's there. Yeah. Okay. And you're on Pinterest too. Yeah. You're everywhere. That's mostly because I like pictures. Of course. <laughs> who doesn't? We're going to pictures of what though? This is what I'm worried about. Suspense well, thriller. <laughs> well, you know, they, they have those private boards and you can use those as a writer to kind of like visual cues that you want for a book. And that's what I use it for. Cool. Okay. I'm going to check that out. It's been an absolute pleasure. We thoroughly enjoyed this novel. It's been just as fun sitting here and diving down deep with Darby Kane. Thank you so much for joining us on Bookstorm. Thank you. Well, Chris, she can go to all those dark places where there's a lot of moral murkiness because of all those years of law practice. That's what I'm convinced. And, and divorce lawyer. She was a divorce that's right. lawyer. That's, that's right. crazy. You, you see people at their worst and their best, and there's certainly a lot to mine. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, one thing you had asked about, and I thought this was kind of a cool concept, is to think about you know, keeping a lie, can, can we keep a lie forever? Or is it something that works its way into the fabric of our life and really starts to maybe, you know, unravel certain aspects of our lives? What do you think? Well, I, I like what Darby said. She says, no, I don't think you can keep it. You've got to let things out. Here's what happens. I think you begin to lie to yourself and you say to yourself, this isn't a lie. This is the truth. I'm not doing anything wrong. Lie can work both ways like that. Or you have absolutely no concern with lying because you're not mentally stable or you're just an evil person. So I can see a few different scenarios there. How about you? Yeah, I think the line between truth and non-truth starts to blur because there's that internal consistency that we all need to have. And where there's that dissonance, now you start acting out. You start trying to squelch it. And I, I just don't think you can do that. If you, yeah, I, we see this in everyday small things, not even big things. You do something in work or relationships that you probably shouldn't have done, nothing big, something small. And you brush it over and lie to yourself and say you were doing it for all sorts of right reasons that in your deepest heart, you know, isn't true, but you start to believe them so you can live with it. Yeah, absolutely. Do we need to talk after the podcast, Chris? No. <laughs> What about the, yes, we do. <laughs> we're not married, but we're in business together. <laughs> um, what about this? I thought this was sort of cool. All these friends that are supposedly keeping a secret, one of their best friends dies from college and they don't want to talk about it. They disperse, they move away from each other and they bury it under the rug. And I thought our desire to walk away and not talk about tragedy is big. Even in today's world, something bad happens to someone, someone dies. Every time we see them, we don't bring it up. We don't say, how are you? We try to push it to the side, act like it never happened. Yeah, Why? Absolutely. Well, and, and here it was tied to, like she noted, a very happy event, graduation. So you know, now there's that whole big black spot in your life that you don't want to revisit. And I think that fleeing or denial or running away is a normal reaction to conflict. You know, there's lots of people who fall on that side of the spectrum and that is escape type responses and even pretending it didn't happen. And, and maybe even suicide is one of those escape type responses, maybe the ultimate one. So I can see where lots of people in response to that internal conflict flee or run or check out. 
I, I don't know. But you it's were a- talking about redemption with her. And Darby yeah. said, I really yeah. feel that in order to redeem that problem in your life, you've got to slowly deal with it. You've got to face it. This is some deep issues, like you said to Darby, that are in this book, very yeah. deep emotional issues. One more question I have to ask you. What do you think about how Emily targeted the boys? This is when she was in high school and college. Okay, here's what they called it. Targeted for an Emily upgrade. So she picked unpopular, um, quirky, um, young men because she was popular and she would date them and she believed she was raising them to a higher social status, but she was really hurting them because it was all fake. She didn't really love them. She didn't really care about them. It was just sort of a little fun game that like fascinated me. What were your thoughts on that? Yeah. Those are signs to me of a class, a manipulator an, a narcissist who has no compunction about using others for her amusement or, you know, whatever she was getting out of it. And I think those are dangerous red flags and those are dangerous people. Barry, I, I, I looked yeah. back on history, the older history, the stories we've heard in books and film was mostly men doing this. Let's just say through history. And the fact that Darby Kane brought up Emily doing this was very intriguing to me. Very intriguing. And it didn't make it right. doesn't matter what sex it is. But I thought it was kind of an interesting flip showing um, sort of a blur on gender when it comes to manipulation and abuse and uh, those types of hurtful things. I liked that she twisted that. Yeah. There are a lot of twists in this story. (laughs) Lots of great twists and turns. You're going to want to read it. The Engagement Party by Darby Kane. You're going to love it. Check her out also as Helen K. Diamond. And in the meantime, we've got such a lineup. I just can't even get over it. We're having so much fun. We have Patricia Cornwell, Unnatural Death, Jenny Colgan, Midnight at the Christmas Bookshop, Virginia Contra, The Fairy Tale Life of Dorothy Gale, Nick Petrie, The Price You Pay, Jill Chavis, The Bright Spot. Our good friend Viola Shipman is returning for the third time with his hubby, Gary. We can't wait. The Wishing Bridge, Mary Kubica, She's Not Sorry, AJ Hatley. Heideke Smith, Demon Dueler, our first young adult novel, C.J. Ray, The Excitements, Joyce Maynard, Bird Hotel, Mich- Mich- Michelle Gable, Beautiful People, Emma Gray, The Last Love Note. Don't sign anybody else up, Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I can't wait. And, and you know, we've been hearing from so many of our guest authors that they don't have anywhere else they're making or having some of these very deep discussions about the themes underlying their books. So we've got a niche. We are so excited that you are growing with us and you're spreading our socials. You can find us, of course, on on all kinds of social media, Facebook and bookstormpodcast.com. We're on YouTube where you can see our authors and a whole lot of other videos. And of course, we want you to stay on the radar with us no matter what. Of course, we are extremely excited about what we have coming up because we are starting our third season which is another thing for us to celebrate and our hundredth episode. So until next time, listeners, one of the best ways to brave the storm is to dive down deep into life-changing fiction.